It is a great pleasure to introduce Donald Taylor as our keynote speaker for this morning. Um, Donald is recognised worldwide as an expert in the area of learning, uh, learning technology, human capital development. Um, he is chairperson of the Learning and Performance Institute, uh, which aims to improve skills for all of trainers in all subjects across a range of disciplines. In, as I said, 2007, he received the Outstanding Contribution in IT Training Award and is regularly recognised as one of the top 10 most influential uh, e-learning experts in the UK and Ireland. So, Donald. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, that, that is grand. I feel like I'm good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's, no, normally, do that with an English audience. Yeah. Yeah, good morning. No response. That's, that's a proper Irish welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's great... Yeah, sorry, there's a slight laugh from the front there, as if there's a proper Irish welcome, and there may also be some, I don't know, bun throwing later on or something if I don't perform. It's not very difficult, actually, if you chair a conference, and I chair three conferences in learning technologies, to be voted as an influential person, because, of course, everyone wants to get onto your conference schedule. So thank you very much for the introduction, Billy, but I'm not bigging myself up too much. I do hope, though, that I'll be able, in the course of the next 30 minutes, to, to say stuff that I hope will be based on experience, uh, rather than what other people have voted, which may prove useful for people in the room who want to get off the ground and be part of what I think is an exciting world of opportunity at the moment for the e-learning space. I know the economic situation isn't too hot right now, but I do think we are in quite a strong position right now. Um, it's always good to be in, in Dublin. It's particularly good to be here for the, for the launch of this centre. Uh, not least because I think anyone who's got their wits around about them knows that Ireland is a place where learning technology has a very strong basis. There's a lot of, there's a lot of expertise here, there's a lot of understanding of it, and it's probably quite a bit ahead of some other parts of Europe. Um, I think I first became aware of that probably in 1999. I was over here uh, on a family holiday, visiting my um, sister-in-law's parents in Sligo, so we drove up to Sligo, drove back, driving across the country. I was very impressed by not just the vibrancy, but of course, of course, there was a, a construction boom at the time, which perhaps we'll put to one side, but there was, there was a vibrancy about the, the economy and about everything that was, that was really exhilarating. Everyone's on their mobile phones, and there were lots of advertising, ad, advertising hoardings up, uh, mentioning the internet. Now, this was a time when the internet was something I did at work. I didn't do it at home. Um, I, if you wanted to get on, you used a 28.8 dial-up modem. Uh, anybody remember that? Yes, some nodding heads. Uh, and yeah, it was all over Ireland. And I, I found myself in the queue at um, Drummer Hare uh, to get on the ferry to come back. And in front of me is a, a, um, a white van. It's a bit dirty, like most white vans. And on the back of it, uh, something was written. The previous year, it would have been Shamrock Rovers for the Cup. This time it was www.cleanme.com and I, I knew I knew at that point that the internet had arrived it was going to change our lives and Ireland was going to be ahead of making things happen there and um, I went back to the UK later on that year I, I quit my job and I set up my own internet startup which I subsequently stole um, and well we'll talk not talk more about that later on we'll talk more about the business of running a business uh, on the internet later on so in the next 30, 20 to 30 minutes or so, um, and although on the schedule it says we're going to do Q&A after this, I think what's going to happen is I'll come off, Johnny will come up, and then we'll do the Q&A together, because I think what we're talking about sits quite nicely together. So we'll do a joint Q&A at the end. Um, in the next 20 to 30 minutes, what I want to talk about is looking back over those past 13 years, what's changed over that period, uh, and in particular, what have we seen in the past two to three years that, as I say, means we're having a real shift in this world of, of learning and development, and in particular in the technology to support it. Where there are changes, there are definitely opportunities, and I think there are opportunities there which people who want to get out there can exploit if it's done in the right way. As Vinnie kindly said, I, I chair the... Oh, let me move on. I chair this institute. It's always, it's always impressive when the chairman of Learning Performance Institute, uh, who chairs all these conferences, holds the bleeper the wrong way round and fails to move things onwards. 
There we go. So I chair this institute, the um, Learning and Performance Institute, yeah, and I chair the Learning Technologies Conference and the Learning Skills Group. Uh, and the Learning and Skills Group is a community of um, about 4,500 people. It's a free-to-join online community, mostly for learning technologists. And the Institute is a paid-for professional body with about 3,500 members, although we're growing quite rapidly nationally and internationally. We'll be up to about 5,000 within two years. And that's all stuff that's, uh, that's in the pipeline, it's guaranteed. Um, and as well as doing this, in my, in my career, I've been um, uh, set up or been involved in the setting up of a couple of companies which we've gone on to sell in the learning technology space. I've um, been sales, I've been marketing, I've uh, board level positions, been a VP, and I've done operational stuff. And I started off, um, like probably a lot of people in the field, in a much simpler world than the one we live in now. I started off in the 1980s as a classroom trainer. And that was a lovely world. It was a lovely world because you had one place to deliver learning in the 1980s. It was the classroom. You had one medium for storing information. We didn't have the internet. We had books. And if you're a bit go-ahead technologically, technologically like, like me, you had videos and you had audio cassettes. And for the younger members of the audience, an audio cassette is <laughs> its not even worth thinking about. So the great thing about being in the classroom was it didn't matter what the subject was. It didn't matter what the question was. The answer was always the same. We'll come to that a little bit later. The answer's in your book. And the answer always was in the book. Because you'd written the book, you knew the answer, it was there, and they came into the room because you were going to give them the information. You were God in the classroom. And unfortunately for some people, perhaps even for me, that was a lovely experience to be the centre of attention. And we know now, actually, it's not a terribly good way of conveying information. Certainly in terms of knowledge transfer, the classroom's a very poor place to do that. Um, it is good for some things. It continues to be the main staple of most learning and development. We were talking about this last night over dinner. About 70% of most budget on learning and development continues to be spent on classroom delivery. And apart from anything else, that definitely represents an opportunity. We're not in this world anymore, though. That may be where most of the activity is, but there's a lot of opportunity as a result of, I think, three major changes that are taking place in learning and development at the moment. Well, in learning and development and beyond that, but it certainly affects what we do. The first is that we are increasingly in what's called, what, what I would call a borderless world. Secondly, Information is now free. And that sounds like a trite thing to say, but I'm going to go on to explain why I think that's absolutely fundamental. And thirdly, the expectations of learners and of managers have changed quite dramatically. And thinking back to 1999 and that different world, when the internet was something you did at work for email, and you, you didn't sit, as I now do in front of TV, with my iPad, in my lap on Twitter interacting with people about the football or about the, the thing I'm watching. That is the world we live in now and we take it for granted and it's only happened over something like 13 years. In fact, most of that has happened in the past, as I say, two, three, four years. There's been a tremendous amount of change. And I'm gonna look at some of the changes, what the world's doing to react to that, how it affects L&D and how I think we can benefit from it. So this is a picture of the old border between uh, Germany, uh, well, West Germany and East Germany, as it was. Um, and, of course, that, that border no longer exists. I think there are three ways in which we, we are in a borderless world. And the, the term borderless workplace is what I've taken from Josh Burson, uh, Burson and Associates in the States. It's uh, something which he uses to explain a couple of things. I'm going to just push it a little bit further. Um, one of the key ways and most obvious ways in which we're in a borderless world is that geographical borders make less difference to us now. I'm regularly on the phone, or not on the phone, sorry, I'm on Skype regularly for across, perhaps in the course of the day, five different time zones. So I might start in uh, Dubai, Armenia, Brussels, London, and then uh, East Coast of America. And we don't bat an eyelid about it. I have a PA, who's a virtual PA, who I've never met, 
She's in Nairobi in Kenya. And I'm on Skype with her all the time, or texting each other. And I pay her to her mobile phone. I go to Western Union online. I don't know how it works. I press some buttons. The money arrives in her mobile phone. And we don't even think about that stuff anymore. That's a fairly obvious one, the geographical changes. Second borderlessness with WIC is the idea that the boundaries around the enterprise are breaking down. If they're not breaking down, they're certainly becoming more permeable. When I, uh, and increasingly, what we're talking about here is the need to deal with what we call the extended enterprise rather than just the enterprise in itself. In other words, something that deals with not just what the payroll that you look after, but also the supply chain that comes into it and the salespeople, the technicians, anybody who in particular touches the customer at the other end. So, lots of examples of how people are providing training to their extended enterprise in a, in a very simple way. Um, B&Q, for example, the um, DIY store in the UK, uh, has for a long time had e-learning, which is made available to customers, designed for internal use, but available to customers. It just means they have a better experience when they're doing DIY. Uh, in the States, Black & Decker do the same thing. They have videos which their salespeople produce. They put on their phones. The salespeople have started using those not just to train themselves, but also to go and talk to customers about. But the, the best example of extended enterprise training that I can think of is Honda Motor Europe, which has has a, um, a, a base of 80,000 learners across, the UK, uh, across Europe in 30 countries in, um, no, sorry, 40 countries, 30 different languages. And the vast majority of these are not employees of the organization. They are technicians or salespeople who touch the customer. And because this organization's key stat is customer satisfaction, they're just trying to make sure that those people are trained up to the same standard as the internal people so that they're delivering the right service. Now, they do that through, as it happens, through a learning management system that delivers the same training to the internal staff, but it's differentiated very cleverly in the back end to make sure that important stuff doesn't leak out. And that whole thing is managed by two people, by the way, which I think is, a, talk about lean manufacture, it's an absolutely extraordinary accomplishment. Increasingly, getting out and training the extended enterprise is going to be a crucial part. And that's really where the borderless workplace comes in. But also, I think there's a third way, a third area in which we are increasingly borderless, and that's in ourselves and the division between our private lives and our public lives. I was um, yesterday... Sorry, no, I don't mean private and public so much as work and private life. Uh, I was yesterday at a, I was talking at an event by the uh, Corporate Research Forum in London about the impact of social media and learning technologies, uh, social media and technology on learning. And it was very interesting, the research they've done, it shows that when organisations make training available to people online, and they don't stipulate you have to do it at home, nonetheless, the biggest hits you get for this online training are usually in the morning before work in commuter time and then after work in the evening after supper. So people are happier to go and do their work, their work of learning in their own time without being prompted to. All right, so we've got a borderless world which has these, these three things. Wh wh where's that coming from? I think it's been driven by two, two major things. Firstly, the internet is everywhere. And I, I don't just mean that you can, although it's true, I sat down at City Airport and I opened up my laptop, I was on Wi-Fi, I arrived at my hotel in Dublin, I'm on Wi-Fi. You can get onto the Wi-Fi, you get onto the internet when you choose, but also it's ubiquitous, almost, it almost reaches every corner of the planet. So you can get on and you can reach everywhere instantly. And the second thing is, of course, and I think we'll hear about this more later on, the ubiquity of mobile devices now. 2012 will be the first year in which more internet access is done via mobile devices than via the laptop or, or desktop computers. And of course, um, we saw on, was it Monday, the launch of the Surface, the Microsoft device? I think when Microsoft puts its weight behind a new operating system and a new physical device that is entirely based around mobility, we know that this is something which is going to be changed in the future. So. We've got those two drivers, mobility and ubiquity of the internet, that's, that's making us be in a borderless world. So what? What happens? Well, there is one big effect we get out of that, 
And I think it's this thing which I said earlier sounds a bit trite, but I think it's actually rather important. Information is free. This is a cloud of obviously it's a cloud. <laughs> it, I'm, I, I, I chose this, I think, subconsciously because it represents perhaps the internet cloud. But I think also because we just take this for granted, like the cloud, well, certainly today, like the cloud. But we take for granted the fact that information is free. Anybody who's, who in uh, previous life had to go through a card index at a university or uh, a library or whatever to find a book, to fish out a single piece of information, understands what I mean by the immense change we've had via the internet and technologies to make information be free. And there's lots of it. Every 60 seconds, 25 hours of video gets uploaded to YouTube. Every 60 seconds. It's a bit horrible, isn't it? How, how could you possibly catch up? One guy wrote in, his, um, in, in an academic journal that if he was to read two journals, two journal papers every evening of every day of the week, by the end of the year, he would be 400 years behind in his reading. There are 168 million mails sent every second. Uh, sorry, every minute. It doesn't make any difference. Most of them seem to arrive in my inbox anyway. Michael Lesk of Rutgers University wrote a really good paper about this earlier in the year. He calculated that there are, we get exposed to roughly a million times more information each day than we can possibly physically remember. You know, people know roughly how much the human mind, a, a good mind can remember. We know how much we've been bombarded with. And right now, let alone what's going to happen in the future, the ratio is a million to one. That has some ser serious implications and some serious opportunities for us. Um, I think the biggest implication, well, the biggest implication is that we've moved from an area where knowledge was power 10 years ago to where information is free. And the impact of that, you can just look, go to the high street to have a look. People who used to trade in information, um, are out of business. So a travel agent would trade on knowing the best routes, being able to get your best fares, and knowing about stuff that you couldn't find anywhere else. They can't compete with TripAdvisor and lastminute.com or somebody else who does these deals. So they have been, in that great 1990s word, disintermediated. We don't even think about that word anymore, but it used to be the, such a buzz in 1999. Disintermediated, everything's gonna change. Well, it has changed, but we haven't noticed because like the clouds, we take it for granted. But there's one other, one other type of, um, uh, of uh, one other area which risks disintermediation, which is actually the learning and development profession itself. This is something I've been banging on about for some time. When information is free, that business of standing up in front of the class and delivering your knowledge becomes pointless. You can't sell somebody something if they can get it for free elsewhere. So there is absolutely no point, for example, trying to write a course in Excel because somebody else somewhere has done it and you can get hold of it for free. When Peter Butler took over as chief learning officer at Lloyd's in the UK, uh, the first thing he did was he went around and found out everyone in the organisation who was writing a course on something that wasn't necessary. And he stopped them doing it. He said, there is no point writing a course in Microsoft Word because we have those already available through the contract we've got with our unnamed but very large e-learning provider. So it's there. You don't need to sell it. And if you try to sell it, then you're going to be out of business. Of course, that doesn't apply to bespoke courseware production for stuff that's actually important to organisations. And there, I think, are great examples of, of, of organisations that do create great courseware and great content. And the trick there, and we'll talk about this a bit later on, I think, is to find out what is the proprietary information that resides within organisations that will really make a difference, will really have an impact if you can distribute it more widely and faster, perhaps to the extent of enterprise. We'll talk about that in a second. I think this business of, of information being free is probably as, as, as much of an impact to our world as Gutenberg's invention of movable type. Movable type enables us to produce to scale. You could turn out pages faster than you could write it on vellum, but the internet allows us to distribute, not just to scale, but to everybody in the world, almost, because of the ubiquity of the internet, at almost no cost, instantaneously. That is massive scale. 
And I think it's worthwhile sometimes taking a moment to just contemplate the effect that has on us. Because sometimes we, we, we continue with models that are out of date because it's what we've learned when the current situation is very different. Of course, the effect of all this is that some people have to change their business models. Brit Brit Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica announced in March of this year that they are no longer producing their hard copy books. These are the books I grew up with, the Encyclopedia Britannica. I used to love this. You go and look things up and you find out stuff. This was the repository of information in the home. Nobody goes and looks for this stuff anymore. It's not in a book. You go and look it up on Google. Well, mind you, some of the things people look up on Google are, are, are a bit odd. Um, if, you know, uh, if you're in America, you go to google.com, you type in how to. What, what do you think, the, what do you think you know, Google is this business of predicting what it is you're going to write? Yeah? If you type in how to in, in google.com, what do you think they, they predict for you in America? Any thoughts? <laughs> how to delete a friend on Facebook. It's not even as technological as that, interesting. How to find a McDonald's. Uh, there's an app for that, I bet you. Yeah, just, yeah, no, anything else? How to Google. It should be, but it isn't, actually. No, it's how to tie a tie. How we, because, of course, American kids, they go through high school, and they don't wear a tie, because they don't have uniforms. They, suddenly, they graduate, and they've got to go to work. Suddenly, they've got got to tie a tie. Where do I go? I'm going to go to the internet to find out. If in German you type in um, how do I, I think the, uh, the, the it suggested, no, no, who was. If in, in Germany, if you type in who was, wer war, it's the answer is suggested, wer war Otto von Bismarck. So who was Otto von Bismarck? Yeah. You know, leading, well actually a leading politician who increased Germany's might across Europe in the 19th century. So that might be telling us something about the zeitgeist in Germany right now. So, <laughs> so they're obviously interested uh, in, in politics. Um, if, you, if you go to, um, if you go to um, uh, uh, the British one, it's who was, it's who was, it suggests Jack the Ripper. Okay, so we're obviously interested in the mythology of our own past, uh, not in reality. And of course, if you go to the US, you type in who was, and what do they suggest in America? Who was? Any idea? Who was that man who appeared at the end of the Avengers movie? That's what it suggests. Right, okay. In Ireland, by the way, it's who was the captain of the Titanic? So obviously a strong, strong interest in history here. I'm not sure what the interest is in the States, apart from being part of this, this churning world we live in of social media. It, sometimes if you look at who was, it's who was voted off American Idol last night. But it's always something that's current in the media. So expectations of our users are different. What does this mean? Well, I'm not sure that I buy the whole digital native thing, that if you're born after 1985, somehow your mind is different and, and you view the world in a different way. I'm not, I'm not sure I quite buy that. But it is true that if you've been doing a lot of stuff in technology, and most kids born after 1985 have been doing a lot of stuff in tech. I say kids, actually. It's not kids anymore, is it? Most people born after 1985 are uh, immersed in technology and have got a great, a great deal of experience with it. And uh, yes, they, they do tend to look at things in a slightly different way. So the expectations are different, but it's not a generational thing. It's a, it's a habitual thing. Uh, if you're on technology a lot, you tend to want to do things fast, for free, and in a user-friendly way. I remember back in the day, in the early part of this century, we were expecting people to get training on how to use their learning management system. Obviously, that's not going to wash anymore. It has to be as friendly as the apps they've got on their iPad, as easy to use as Google. Also, the type of stuff people want to learn from is different now. There's a lot more emphasis on video, for example. So um, I was <laughs> on Sunday. My daughter, the next day, Monday, had to appear in fancy dress at school. Don't you hate this? You get a letter from school on the Friday saying, oh, and by the way, on Monday, your child has to be a dragon or something. Right. In this case, she had to be a film character, and she was going to be Charlie Chaplin. So we got everything. Right? We got the hat, spray-painted the hat, we had all the outfits, but it never came. Right? So we had some bamboo. I went and got some bamboo from the, from the garden centre. But of course, Charlie Chaplin became Benz at the top. 
So I'm out there in the garden with the power saw and this, that, and the other, trying to make this bamboo bend. My son comes out with the iPad, says, Dad, I looked up on Google. I looked up on YouTube. It's like the second most searched thing in the world. Looked up on YouTube. And sure enough, he's got, he's got a video. How to, <laughs> how to bend bamboo. How obscure is that? And uh, we worked out. We didn't have the jig. We didn't have one and a half hours to steam the bamboo. And we didn't have a blowtorch to soften it up with. But anyway, that meant at least I knew that I could abandon bending the bamboo in one particular way. And we, we got there in the end another way. Video then is one thing people are naturally going for, to for information. Another thing is that they tend to want this information to be shorter and easy to digest. So typically now, we're finding that people, are, when they're putting out videos, we're looking at five minutes or less. I heard somebody the other day say, yes, we've got bite-sized learning. All our courses on video are 20 minutes long. Forget it. Like nobody's going to sit through the past five minutes of that course. It's not going to happen. And the other thing, of course, is the social element. Increasingly, people are expecting to learn from each other. There's been a shift on who we expect to take seriously from authority to the people we trust. And we trust people for various different reasons, partly because of who we know they hang out with online, partly because people like Vinny stand up in front of them and say, yeah, Don's been voted on this list, and partly because of what we know they've actually done, rather than some spurious authority. A great example of all these three things is Dare to Share at BT, where they gave their, all their field engineers um, flip cameras. And there was a bunch of issues they had that they met in the field every time. The guys would take a video of the issues they faced and how to tackle it, post it up online. Videos were typically short, perhaps four to five minutes long. They were user-generated content by authority. So people trusted these people to do this stuff, not because they were the head of learning at BT, but because they were like them, facing it in the field. And they were practical. So those sorts of expectations we now have of being able to find performance support tools online, they were met with very well there, and they had an actual immediate effect on BT's bottom line. Because BT have a problem with field engineers taking more than one call to finish something off. It's expensive and it frustrates the customer. That process, which was cheap to use and the whole thing ran on SharePoint, brought down the number of more than the number of sales, number of calls that took more than one visit dramatically. Managers, of course, managers, of course, are trying to respond to this, and so uh, we're used to the idea of, of social being important for people. United Biscuits brought in a whole bunch of new people. And they said, well, what we should do is make sure these people uh, have a Facebook page um, in the training they're doing. They went through it. They looked at it. Um, they spent a lot of time designing it. And eventually, they got the Facebook page up and running, at which point they discovered that the new trainees in from the graduates already had a Facebook page up and running. And it wasn't saying some very complimentary things about the training they were receiving at United Biscuits. So they had a word, they closed down the Facebook page, which was in the public domain, and they brought it inside the firewall. So the expectations of managers are changing, the expectations of learners are changing as well. So there are three big shifts that are taking place, expectations, information, and uh, borderlessness. And it's affecting learning and development, it's a, and the world's responding to it. I'm just going to ask, I'm just going to look very quickly at how is L&D responding, how is the world responding, and what should we do about it? Changing the role of L&D, we, we are 100% moving away. And I say 100%, what I mean is everybody accepts this has to happen, although most work is still taking place in this field of design, develop, and deliver a course, and then be the centre of attention like the trainer in the classroom. In other words, typically be a bottleneck because you have to get scheduled to get something done. Less so with an online course, but still, that's the process which traditionally we've been in and which is still the mainstay of L&D. We're moving towards this. With all that information out there, a million more things than we can remember each day, one of the key jobs of L&D is not to go and create stuff, but to go and find stuff that's already there, whether it's how to do something for BT or how to bend a bamboo. Find the good stuff and bring it in. It's also our job to facilitate conversation between people because we trust people who we believe in because we believe in what they've done. Facilitating helps the trust build helps the flow of information. And because there's so much stuff out there, it's crucial that we filter and interpret that so that people aren't bombarded, but 
They don't have the key to the entire library. They have, yes, the key to the library, but they also have a guide to take them through what they need to do to go up to speed. And then it's the job of learning and development in organisations. This is a phrase I bang on about with people all the time in my institutes, to get out of the way. People are adults, they can learn if we give them the systems and the materials to do it. How's the world responding? That's how LMD is slowly responding to it in the corporate learning space. How's the world responding? I'm going to quickly look at a couple of these and then wrap up. Um, Ericsson in Sweden have done a great job. They've got a, a learning management system back end. They've, they've coupled that with um, SharePoint and with some instant messaging stuff. And suddenly they've got something where Ericsson are not in the middle creating materials. They're pulling in materials from everywhere else. They're using this to facilitate a Twitter-like environment between people that gives people alerts when something they're interested in pops up. And the whole thing is running without LMD being the bottleneck that has to create stuff. They facilitate it. Interestingly for Ericsson, it's not on mobile. The reason it's not on mobile, there's no demand for it, they say. That will be changing this year, they reckon. ESCOM produces 95% of South Africa's energy. They've got over 20 power stations in South Africa. They have a problem. They've got a lot of engineers coming in as they build new power stations. Each power station has something like a million parts, and each of those things has a manual or some bit of documentation associated with it. They brought in a knowledge management system that enables them to track all that documentation but link it through to a social media platform so that people can understand when something new has popped up in their domain and they can go and inspect it make sure they know the latest thing. In other words, they're not expecting people to learn a million things, only the stuff that's new and relevant to them. I was in Qatar in February talking there about um, how they can move their learning technologies forward. Like Saudi Arabia, Qatar is very keen on getting people out of classroom training, which still accounts for uh, probably 95% of training in the Gulf. And they've taken a government-directed approach, which is to simply buy a big license, spread it out across companies for free, and just get people, handhold them through the process of moving out of the classroom onto e-learning. They're now in the process of, if you like, taking away that crutch. It's no longer available for free, and they're making other learning development platforms available to people, but it's now a free market. I do believe that places like Qatar and the Gulf probably represent, given certain caveats, rich market for people who've got something useful to sell. <coughs> I'm not going to talk about open coursework and consortium because I think, John, you're going to talk about that later on. I certainly it will be mentioned. This is, uh, as you know, universities across the world sharing courses because courses aren't where it matters. The quality is, and the value is in what you deliver around it, the service around it. And finally, TTI. TTI have really got this point about distributing stuff out down the sales channel as quickly as possible because speed is everything. They used to have a six monthly cycle for launching new products and they're, they're a $3.7 billion company that does power tools. They used to have a, a six month cycle. They've now stripped that away and instead of training, pulling everybody together to train every six months, they send all the training out via the LMS. The LMS, as far as the sales guys are concerned, isn't a training platform, it's where they know about new products. That enables them to know immediately what's going on with their products and to go out and sell it faster. If your product lifespan is five years, which it is probably for a power tool, and you can reduce the, let's say the average life cycle, the average time to wait between product launch and training is three months. If you can take away that three months because it's almost instantaneous, then you've added the amount of selling time you've got for a power tool by 5%. 5% extra selling time on the tool right at the beginning of when it's available provides a tremendous financial kick to the organisation. They spent $850,000 installing their LMS, doing all the stuff you need to put that in place. They increased sales, sorry, the increase in sales that was attributable to the sales training, they think is worth something like $11 million. So, bona fide return on investment simply by doing things faster and getting the short information out to people is natural. Okay, we've got a world where there are lots of changes. We've got a world where uh, there's opportunity because where there's change, there's opportunity. And we've got a world where there's also organisations responding to an LMD probably suffering a bit. What should Ireland 
do about this, which, as I said right at the beginning of the place where there's a, a tremendous now body of experience in this field and a great technological, I think, foundation to build on. We've been, in, we've been close to the situation before, actually, of, of uh, a difficult economic situation and the need to take action. Um, does anybody remember this? In 1984, I remember seeing adverts from this campaign in the Scientific American. Well, what, what, why, why is Ireland advertising that it's the young Europeans in the Scientific American? <coughs> For a very good reason. To boost investment, inward investment into Ireland. And the advertising campaign in 1984, combined with uh, st other structured activities, did lead to inward investment, did lead to the growing of the technological base. It was a great centralised initiative to make things happen. As you know, in the UK, we're all very keen on the free market and letting things go and letting things happen. And sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you do have to take action and make things happen centrally. And that's why I'm delighted to be here at the launch of the Centre for Learning Innovation, because not only is it in underpinned by research, not only is it backed by the government, and not only does it have all these links between education and corporate learning, all of which I think is tremendously important, most importantly, it draws on an existing body of experience we've got here in Ireland. People like, people, well, there are lots of people in this room who've been in this industry for 20 plus years who know not just about learning, not just about technology, but also about the difficult business of running a startup, making it work in bad times as well as good in this particular field. And that's, an, that's a gold mine. That's a gold mine to draw on. And I think it's fantastic that it's able to be brought together and backed up by as was mentioned earlier, uh, a centre which is something like six years in the making. I thought I, Johnny Parks has been talking about the centre forever, it seems. Yes, it's coming, yes, it's coming, yes, it's coming. I thought it was like one of those Irish sagas which just goes on and on and never actually reaches an end. But it, it has reached, not an end, but a beginning today. And I'm delighted to be here at the start. I should say, I'm not being paid to say any of this, and I don't have any shares in the Centre for Learning Innovation, I just wish that we had one of these in the UK. <coughs> and as we don't, I'll be delighted to give the support that I can give from the Institute to making sure the Centre for Learning Innovation is the success that it undoubtedly deserves to be. Thank you very much.